With that in mind, um, let's start my tutorial this morning. Um, so I've called it Our Industry Under Investigation because I truly believe that people don't know what they need to know about our industry. We're looking at accreditation, endorsements and regulation, and I know that that's something that gets a lot of um, noise uh, from all sorts of angles. This is not to um, uh, put down any type of um, training whatsoever, but it is really just to make sure that everybody understands um, the options available really and you know why you need your course validated or approved or accredited or endorsed or whatever you want to call it why what, what's the purpose and when I started thinking about it I came up with four main areas that you would want to get your course validated and the top one is insurance now I know that you are probably aware you may not be aware but actually there is no legal requirement for you to have anything other than employers and public uh, indemnity insurance so what we call the um, professional practice uh, liability uh, or professional indemnity or treatment risk or anything like that is actually not a legal requirement so you can't be put in prison for doing a bad treatment. You can be sued uh, privately through the civil courts. And of course, that's where people go if they feel that they're, they have um, some form of um, recourse from the training that they get or the treatments that they have. So we're looking at this from two aspects. We're looking at it from you as a training provider, making sure that you are protecting yourself from a student doing something wrong and coming back and saying, well, you didn't teach me properly. Um, but also from you as a practitioner's point of view, if you do a treatment and a client is unhappy with the outcome. So insurance is a, a very, very big part. And that's why a lot of the accreditation process actually goes through a broker. The second thing is validation. You might want a rubber stamp on your course for somebody else to tell you that you are doing the right thing in the right way and you want to use that for your own promotion. So validation is a really, really important thing to have. Then we have licensing legislation and registration. Now, sadly, um, there isn't a lot of that in our industry. There are very few people that need to be licensed. Um, we have no real legislation specifically for beauty, hair and nails. However, there is plenty of legislation out there. We don't need any more. Um, if you look at the Health and Safety Act, you look at all of the legislation that falls underneath that, it's all there. Um, so, and all the consumer protection, the trading standards, it's all there. We don't need any more. We just need to follow what we've got. And then of course there's the registration and there again is a very few ways that you can become a registered uh, professional. In complementary therapies, there is CNHC, FHT have their professional standards um, register. And I think the aesthetic industry now have a professional standards authority register. So there are some, and you would need your, your training endorsed for that. And of course, lastly is funding. Um, if you want to dip into funding of any kind, then you would need your course validated by somebody to make sure that it is appropriate and fit for purpose. Okay, so which one do you fit into? I truly believe that everybody should have options and it's not one size fits all. It's about understanding what it is that you are offering your students and is that fit for purpose? So being mindful of trading standards, what you are offering your learners and the consumer protection, which is all about making sure that the the, the student that you are training gets what they um, deserve and what they need is really, really important. I'm not sure that we need any more regulation. I think that we've got it. And I've said before, I think what we need to do as an industry is step up, think about what we're doing and how we're doing it and make good choices. So I've categorized training into four different areas and I think they're all valid. I think they all have their place. And I think that it's really important that we recognize which one is appropriate for which type of learner. So regulated qualifications, we talked a little bit about last week. 
We then have something called endorsements, which you may or may not be aware of, short course provision and continued professional development. So qualifications, we looked at this last week and we looked at all the different awarding bodies that there were. And we talked about the um, Ofqual regulated and the little logo that's on the right hand side here. Some people have actually contacted me in the week and said, I'm really worried my, my certificates don't appear to be Ofqual regulated and I'm really worried about this, is it a problem? And I think it's really, really important to, to actually recognize that while Ofqual regulated qualifications are have their place, they are for a certain type of learner wanting to do a certain type of thing. They're not the only thing that you should be looking at, but if you are concerned, you need to look at your certificate. And if it does not have this logo in some way, the, the colors might be slightly different. It might be black and white. The, um, the, the wording might be underneath rather than to the right. There's lots of different logos. But if it does not say off qual regulated, it is not off qual regulated, full stop. It might be based on the National Occupational Standards. It might be a really good training, but it's not an Ofqual regulated. And I think we need to um, stop beating people up for the fact that it's not Ofqual regulated if they don't need one. And we'll, we'll look at why you might need one a little bit later. With an Ofqual regulated qualification, one of the things that is um, uh, really um, important is that to offer it as an organization, you need to have um, qualified educators and assessors that hold one level above what you are delivering. Now I know that this is not the case. I know that there are plenty of places that are delivering qualifications that are not one step below. And it's very difficult in some uh, occupational standards. So beauty therapy is a prime example. If you were delivering a level two manicure and pedicure qualification, there actually isn't a level three manicure and pedicure qualification that you could have because nail technology is different from manicure and pedicure. So you can't have a one step up, but there are definitely some um, occupational areas where you really should be one step above what you're actually teaching. And it's up to you as uh, an organization and with in association with your uh, EQA and your various other people within the organizations to ensure that you have that knowledge and skill that you can actually help the learners achieve what they, they need to do. You also have to have an assessment strategy that's audited. And the uh, awarding organization produces the certificates. So this might not be something that is appropriate for you. So the next option is that you might look for an endorsement to your training. So an endorsement is used specifically where there is no regulated qualification. You could meet the standards, but there are no standards to actually meet. It's designed really for um, anybody who is wanting to provide recognition for a bespoke process or a brand training. So if you have a way of training that is very peculiar, peculiar, particular to your way of delivering education and training, then an endorsement might be the right way to go for you. There are rigorous, 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 rigorous approval processes. So you would be going through a process which actually mirrors the regulated um, fr framework. So you would be having to supply all of the same documentation. You would um, also be um, expected to have the assessment strategy. You would be verified or audited for um, the processes of what goes on in your organizations. And again, the awarding organization provides that certification. So that's another option. Then we have short course provision, and this is where the majority of training in our industry sits. Now, short course provision was really set up as an option for bite-sized qualifications, and it was very, very useful for unitization before the QCF was established. And if you listen to the tutorial I did last week, QCF was the precursor to the RQF. So the RQF, the regulatory framework that we have now, before that was the um, qualification um, curriculum framework. And what that did is it broke up our picture into jigsaw pieces. 
and it allowed unit you users to actually pick off uh, just one unit to get an Ofqua regulated qualification in just that unit. But before QCF came on board, which I think was around about 2010, but please do correct me if I'm wrong. Um, before that, we didn't have anything. So it was very much an all or nothing. And certainly when I did my training and probably a lot of people in the, in the talk today, when you did your training, it was an all or nothing. You did your two years or your three years and you either got your qualification or you didn't, which meant that when employers were um, advertising for a beauty therapist, somebody who applied had a beauty therapy qualification and the employers knew exactly what was involved in that. But now, and certainly um, uh, uh, post 2010, we've got no idea because every framework is slightly different. Um, every awarding organization has their own structure and it's very difficult. So short course provision is really, really useful for um, bite-sized learning or used as an introduction to allow learners to, to get some knowledge and skill. It's really, really fabulous for any industry where there is no professional practice um, licensing required. And of course that, that fits the hair and beauty industry perfectly because we don't have a license to practice. Therefore, a short course provision in a lot of cases is perfectly acceptable. There tends to be little or no assessment strategy. So it was very, very useful for community learning, evening classes, where you really wanted just to learn how to do something and be able to do it. You didn't want to have to jump through the hoops of um, being assessed every which way um, and, um, you know, having to um, having to take a certain amount of time to do it as well. Now, the accrediting bodies that there are for these short course provisions really, really do vary. And this is where you as an individual just have to do your homework. So when we looked at um, uh, the options, there were many different criteria. So some asked for educators that had an off core regulation. Uh, qualification and some weren't weren't too bothered whether you did or you didn't um, and some insisted that you had occupational qualifications held in the industry for up to two years before you were able to deliver the qualification so from that point of view short course provision gives maximum flexibility so it's a good thing yeah and then lastly we have cpd so it stands for continued professional development. It's something that we should all do. Um, they tend to be one day workshops, uh, maybe online tutorials designed to enhance existing skills, certainly not entry to industry. Designed for updating skills, knowledge where legislation changes. So fantastic over the last 12 months where we have had uh, a lot of changes going on. So CBD in, um, uh, up, updating uh, health and safety legislation or even protocols is fantastic. Quite often they're brand led, maybe learning new techniques, new products, enhancements or, or different protocols. So a different way of thinking. Our industry is really, really led by the product manufacturers. They are the ones that set the pace um, and education has to hurriedly catch up behind them. So very, very good for learning new techniques, but as a bolt on for um, training that you've already got. And generally they have no prerequisites because um, the educators are people in industry that are actually able just to, 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 to enhance um, and progress your skills. So you could say that these tutorials are CPD. Um, the other thing with CPD is that if you belong to a professional association, they might very well require you to do a certain number of CPDs which could be all sorts of things. It could be professional practice, it could be sharing skills, it could be attending um, workshops, going to professional beauty or Excel. All of those sorts of things are all about continuing your professional development. But the key word here is continuing, not starting. So when you're setting up um, a training um, offering to people, I think for me, the most important thing is, is the top one here. It's who are you educating? How are you educating them? And why are you educating them? What do you actually want these people to be able to do at the end of your training? Simple question, but I think it's something that a lot of people don't really actually think about. Your why is so important. Why are you actually doing this? 
Because once you understand your why, you can then go back and think, well, what's my right vehicle for actually empowering uh, the people that um, I, want to, I want to help and develop? So on the left-hand side, these are all the things that without question, you should have as part of your um, provision to your students. And I think most of them are quite um, straightforward and probably anybody who is offering um, training will already have. The one thing that probably they won't have and something that I think is, is probably really, really important is the information and guidance and the onboarding process. And that's something I want to just touch on in the next slide. Over on the right hand side, however, are things that each accrediting organization may or may not ask you for. And this is your job. I'm not going to tell you which is the best um, accreditation organization. This is your job based on your who, your how and your why. You need to look at what can this awarding organization or accrediting organization, should I say, sorry, what can they offer me and what do they want from me and what am I able to give them? So some of them will want to do a site visit. Some of them really don't care where you deliver from. Some will want a quality assurance process in place. And some not even bothered whether you have a multiple choice test at the end of it. So you have to think, what do I stand for as a trainer and as an educator? Do I want the quickest, easiest route to getting my students insured? And that's another big question. Are they insured, really? Or do I want to provide a pathway and a process for my learners to go through? And even if you took away the need for accreditation, I would still do what I do because I believe that it's the right thing to do. Some of the organizations also want you to become a member. So you have to have your insurance with them. You have to have your teaching insurance with them. All of your students can only be insured through them. So you also have to ask yourself, is that best for the learner to be um, penned in to this one insurance company? What happens if they want to add on skills and they want to, to go somewhere else? Would it be recognized? So I think those are the things that you need to be asking. An overview of qualifications. I think we talked about this last time. So City and Guilds, VTCT, ITEX, SIBTEC and SIDESCO. But then I've added Highfields, Pearson, EdXL and TQ UK because they are the ones that offer the teach training. Endorsements, SIBTEC and City and Guilds are the two um, companies that actually offer endorsements. So you, they are for approved centres. So you actually have to be approved to offer qualifications through them as well. And they will only endorse something where there is no qualification on the NOS. So cancer touch therapy is something that SIBTEC have endorsed recently. And on-site seated massage, chair massage, is something that SIBTEC, um, sorry, City and Guilds endorsed a number of years ago. Accredited uh, accreditation organizations. I think I've captured them all. I may not have done, and I apologize if you are accredited through an organization which I've not captured here. I think really what I just wanted to do was to show you a list of all the different ones that there are. And they all have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but I think one of my questions that if I was um, looking for an accreditation company, I would want to ask is who are they? Who are the people behind the people, behind the name, if you like, that are offering the accreditation and what gives them the right to offer the accreditation? There is no right. Nobody has any right to, to anything in our industry. So you have to make your own judgment based on their integrity of their organisation. And that's really up, up to you. So my, I think what I would like to like to think that this would do is just maybe get people to kind of think about why they went with the organization that they went with. Um, we as an organization offer City and Guilds accreditation and I went with the easiest route because it was a bolt on to everything that I did. So that was my decision. CPD. I would argue that you don't need accreditation for CPD. 
all of the um, accreditation bodies will offer CPD accreditation, but you don't really need it because the person is already qualified in the first place. So all you're doing is you're continuing their professional development. So in-house training, your own brand should be enough. Um, a product brand, you know, lots of people um, really want to have that seal of approval from a company, an organization, but they're not an awarding organization. They are brand. And that's really important as well. So I touched on earlier information and guidance, and this is something that I feel is really, really important that everybody should do, whether you are doing a CPD course, whether you are doing a regulated qualification, you are responsible, accountable, and should be authentic in what you are delivering. Otherwise, you shouldn't be delivering education and training. You are giving somebody um, the opportunity to develop a career why should they invest their time, money and effort with you as a training organisation? Why? Because they can actually build a career, build a business with what you are giving them, or they can be completely and utterly failed because they think they're getting something that they're not. Or it could be you're putting them through a qualification or they don't need a qualification. They actually only need a short course or they actually need some CPD. And making them do a qualification is really not um, the best way to go. So I would like to urge you to put yourself in your learner's shoes and think about, are you giving them what they need or what they want? Or are you looking to sell them a product because you are gonna make some money from it? And I think that's, that's really what I wanted this tutorial was to sort of, get the uh, the wheel cogs going and, and 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 let's have a discussion about what are we doing how are we doing it and why are we doing it um so first of all then um would anybody like to disagree with anything that i've said and challenge me about anything that's probably a good way to start i put my hands up um i would say i think um you're absolutely right in what you say is that you should be looking at what the needs of your uh, student is, what, what are their real needs? It's like, okay, although I have, um, you know, I work with uh, Tedesco, Sintac, Teen Gills, I look at what someone actually needs. So just because I have involvement with them doesn't necessarily mean that I will say to them, you know, go and get accredited with debt because, you know, I want to make money or anything else. I think through it, and an example of that is I had someone approach me the other day that wanted some information on the best um, awards and organisation for their industry. And I sent them to BTCT because that fitted exactly what the needs of her particular mm -hmm. students needed. So I think that's really important that we do think about, as um, Louise has said, what are we wanting to achieve and what is the student actually need? I think that's so important. That's my opinion's worth. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi, Linda. Hi. <laughs> I'm not sure how this works. I mean, um, we have got a reaction bottom of the a reaction to the bottom there. So I had my hand up, my virtual hand up before, but are you look, you're looking for real hands. That's fine. No, no, no. I was looking for virtual hands as well, but I'm sorry, I just didn't. Uh, didn't. No, no, it's fine. That. No, no, it's absolutely fine. Um, I was just going to um, ask about the short courses. Um, obviously, units. Um, we know that City and Guilds, you can um, have unit accreditation for individual units. I think that. Um, the future of especially mature students, adult learners, they're probably going to be looking at more short courses as an option rather than um, doing, like you say, the whole um, two year course because time restraints and, and money and, and, and also they might want to specialise in a certain area, they might not want the whole package, is, which is kind of what I, all my, um, all my courses are based on one subject area. I'm, I'm hairdressing, so all individual subject areas along the lines of um, city and guilds. Um, what I was going to say is um, when we do short courses, if they are regulated by city and guilds, for example, are they still, um, do you still need to have um, 
the endpoint assessment for a short course, for a unit course? Does anyone know the answer to that? Yeah, I can answer that for you. Um, and the answer is it depends. It depends on which scheme that you are offering. So um, when is it? Uh, da, da, da. Next week, I'm looking at funding and financing. The week after that, I'm looking at qualification types. So within qualification types, there are five different uh, structures under the regulated framework. And it depends on which one you are wanting to, to do. So if I just throw at you uh, T-levels, technicals, NVQs, apprenticeships, and VRQs, it depends. Oh, it depends. <laughs> so I'm, I would suggest we can have a, um, a, a an off um, site conversation about that, Linda. Um, knowing what I know about what you do and the way you do it, I think VRQs 100% is where you would go if you wanted to offer a regulated qualification. However, you may also want to offer short course provision um, and then you would be looking at um, an accreditation company rather than a regulated qualification. Yeah. Um, somebody has just asked um, uh, to do with CPD points. Now, CPD points are something that are peculiar to the um, organisation. So the organisation will set the limit of X number of CPD points to renew your membership. Now, I there aren't that many organized professional organizations that require you to um, submit a CPD plan every year with points on it. The Association of Reflexologists do, and they require 30 points a year, which is basically 30 hours of CPD. The FH2, FHT do, and I don't know how many points, but again, they require specific documented points of what you have done. Um, I'm not aware that any others actually require that documentation process as part of the renewal process. Yeah, so, so we've got, um, Rebecca's asked a question in the chat as well, but does anybody have an experience with both options, pros and cons? <laughs> Donna, you do as well, don't you? I do. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I, I run VRQ qualifications um, previously through VTCT, but now through um, City and Guilds. Um, and that's just purely just because I, I wanted a slightly different setup and I prefer the setup for the VRQs with City and Guilds. And I also have accredited courses as well. So I run a bit of both. Um, all my accredited courses do match the NOS as well anyway. So to be honest, actually, the only difference there is between both of my types of qualification is literally just the, the assessment actually that's the only thing that makes the difference it's either my assessment or it's the awarding organization's assessment that's the only difference between the two but the, the input is actually exactly the same um, and the same length of time as well actually for all of it so the auditing process isn't it Donna because yeah the, yeah I mean obviously yeah my, myself my self-accredited isn't audited by anybody um but I still keep a track of all that kind of paperwork because I can't help myself but then I've come from a college and I'm set up like a little mini college as well so you really can't take the college out of someone like me but yeah so it doesn't get audited um as far as my accreditation company goes they just want to know every year for my money um if I've just changed anything in my manuals or not really and if I have just to highlight it in red and send it off and then hand over the money <laughs> Yeah, and, and it comes down to, um, Mario made a very good point about the, um, you know, there's plenty of reg um, regulations in place, there are, but they are not being adhered to, and because of the cuts, nobody is checking, and so I personally, I don't think that that should matter. If we are professionals, and we are wanting to do a professional job, and we are wanting our industry to be professional, it's very easy, just, just, follow legislation, follow, follow what is in place, do the right thing. It's very simple. And that's what the government want from us. They want to see that we can actually self-regulate ourselves. Um, and this is why there are so many little pockets of, um, I mean, if you, if you take GTI, for instance, as an example, they have done exactly what the government have, have asked the industry to do. And that is, create a pathway where you can you can join them and their way of doing things and you can offer their courses and you can have their badge of honor and you can be on their list of gti you know courses and that's actually 
what the government want us to do. Now, I'm not saying any more about that, and I don't particularly want this to kind of go off into a, these are good, these are bad, whatever, because everybody has their own um, sort of level of integrity. Um, and, um, but, you know, just ask yourself the question, you know, are you going for the cheapest, the quickest, the lowest level, or does it not matter because you're actually, you're doing your IAG, you're doing your um, assessment plans, you're monitoring, you're supporting, you're advising, you're doing your CPD, you're teaching to the best of your ability, you're guiding, supporting. And if you're doing that, it almost really doesn't matter which awarding body, accreditation body that you go through, because at the end of the day, the learner is getting what the learner needs to progress in the industry. And it's only when things go wrong and we have <laughs> these poor learners that go out there and, and suddenly hit a brick wall or suddenly become sued or suddenly become, you know, disillusioned because they thought they knew something and they suddenly found that they don't know anything about anything that you start to then unpack it. And it's like the layers of the onion. You know, you don't know what you don't know. And you suddenly sort of go, oh, my goodness, I need to go back and check that. Am I doing that? What do I need to do to step up? And um, Donna said something that was really uh, made me laugh earlier in the week. She said, Louise is part of the, the greater good what did you say? I think, I think we said the greater, greater good gang. Greater good gang, <laughs> yeah. And I thought, you know what, that's what it is. Um, and it is about um, setting the, the sort of the benchmark and saying, look, this is what we should be doing as an organization. Let's everybody do it and let's everybody step up. And if you can't, what can we do to help you? We can't do anything for those people that go, well, I don't care. I just want to run this 50 pound course tomorrow and earn some money. Can't help those people. They'll always be there and you can't stamp them out because if you stamp them out in one way, they'll pop up somewhere else. They're like little weeds that kind of pop up. So it's about, I think, us kind of pulling together and saying, this is what the standards are. We're going to meet those standards and we're going to champion those standards. I think you've got quite a few questions now coming in the chat as well. Good. Which Good. are popping up. Um, you said about the CPD points, actually, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Right, Sylvia. I've been doing hair and barbering for over 30 years, but for some reason, back when I did my training, I never got my certificate for barbering. Uh, most training providers have been happy for me to do CPD for barbering as a top up, happy with my professional experience. I'm now being made to do my level three barbering qual before I'm allowed to teach the sub. OK, so I think that that really comes down to two things. Um, is it the awarding body or is it the organisation or is it an off qual regulation? So it could be the organisation want to do that because they that is part of their mission statement. Um, that is their integrity and they want everybody to have the qualification that they're teaching. Um, and I think that you either kind of respect that or you don't respect that. Um, awarding organisations, um, are they doing it because they want to uh, ensure that you have a minimum standard and that you understand the process which that learner would have to go through to get that qualification. So is it sort of almost part of a CPD process of if I, if I put you through this qualification, then you understand it, therefore you can support your learner best? Or is it an off qual regulation that says you have to have it? Um, or is it just somebody being arsey? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But that, to be honest, um, Silva, that, that doesn't surprise me. Um, but there is a way and there is a, um, a, a, a an option called accredited for prior learning. It's probably called something different now because I've been out of the game for a while, but accreditation of prior knowledge, prior achievement, prior something rather. But basically, I do this with people. It's looking at who are you? What have you got? What do you know? What don't you know? Where are the gaps? So where is the sand within the stone? Let's create a training program just for the stone bit that you need to know. And then let's just get you to the assessment process as quickly as possible without going back to the beginning and doing education again. And there are two key differences. If you're being made to go back to the beginning and sit in a class with people and do the qualification, that's wrong. If you're being made to go through the process, then that's probably quite a good thing. Yeah. Um, Jen, you've got your hand up. Yeah, so there's people with hands up, I think, and we've got another question that's in the chat too. Okay. You want to do the hand up one? Who's got the hand up? Helen, you've got your hand up. Do you want to um, unmute yourself? Hi. I just wanted to add um, a little bit about the in-between gap. For, I'd say the last five years ago, I've mostly specialised down the lash route. 
and they have no contact really with awarding bodies. And there's a lot of people coming into um, the beauty industry now via short courses. And like Kim said, there's, it's got to be about providing the right thing for the right person. But what I'm finding, one of the issues is those that are coming down the short course route have every right to do that, but they're missing that vital education and vital information because mm-hmm. they're not getting it provided by the, accredit- um, the accreditation companies. And it'd be so much better if we could see more availability of NVQs to those doing that route because I wouldn't go back to college I wouldn't send my staff back to college but I want them to have NVQs and it's actually quite difficult unless you're a big establishment to do that and we're missing this whole group of people that don't even know anything about about the awarding bodies because they've not come from that route. Does that make sense? Yeah Helen can I just um, just jump in there though you Mm. said NVQs I'm not sure you necessarily mean an MVQ because an MVQ is a workplace assessment and is not actually appropriate for an adult learner. That's why they brought on board the VRQ, which right. is vocationally related qualification. So that actually is an appropriate route for mm-hmm. an adult to go through. Um, an MVQ really is designed for people that are actually in employment already. So if you were to take on a young person into your salon and you were to teach them on the job, if you like, then the assessment process that you would put them through would would be the route for an NVQ, even if Sorry, you I should have said qualifications. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's just important because this word NVQ gets banded about um, by insurance companies, by all sorts of things. And and actually an NVQ is quite restrictive as to the type mm-hmm. of person that should be doing it and the assessment strategy that links to that. And uh, on the whenever it was that I said we were going to look at it, um, on the 13th we're going to be talking about different types of qualifications and what type of learner that qualification is most appropriate for um so there's there's some exciting things coming up actually yeah it's uh, a APL now accredited prior learning what is what they call it then but people still use RPL anyway but I I agree with you and you know um a lot of um, centres and people that I work with, I suggest that they do that. Because like you say, if somebody's had 20 years of, of doing something, nobody wants to go back and sit in the classroom no. and start all over again. What they want to do is get that, you know, piece of paper through a means. And, you know, you can set up your own. I mean, I, I don't know so much about sitting girls with the CT, but I do know that... Um, Tedesco do postgraduate, so you can, you know, go along and do that one. I know that um, SIDTAC do RPL and you can go and do it away and do that one as well. And I think it's really beneficial for all those people out there that we start to talk a lot more about this so that people know that it's available and, you know, they're working, they enjoy what they do, they've got the skills, but let's give them something that they've worked so hard for. We're, we're almost risking a divide between the beauty therapists that have gone down the college road and those yeah. that are in short courses. And it's actually getting people's backs up a little bit. And I, I totally yeah. empathise because I've taught short courses and I, because I predominantly deal with a lot of eyelash extensions now, I speak to a lot of eyelash technicians who have nothing to do with beauty anymore. Yeah. And we've created almost, um, yeah, we've created a divide where it's, well, we've done a, you know, we're doing the, the full college route, we've got those qualifications, but those people need better support and more, um, they need, we, the message needs to be out there more and more availability for them to do qualification routes um, and better respected. And I think that's where we're getting some issues and why people are getting angry in these conversations because they've not come down that channel and they feel um, a little bit attacked. Absolutely. And, you know, in some cases they are absolutely being attacked. And I, I, I really do feel that um, we've got two issues here. The issue of you've either got a regulated qualification or you haven't. Mm-hmm. And you can't you can't kind of pretend that you have when you haven't. You can't say, well, I've had really good training. So therefore, I've you know, I've got the equivalent of you either have or you haven't. It's either got enough call stamp on it or it haven't full stop. But then within the I haven't, I've got short course training provision. That's where this kind of concertina thing is going on. And there is absolutely nothing to differentiate 
a one day course to an online course to a five day course to a six months program that actually gives you short course accreditation. And Helen, I think this is where we need to really focus the efforts of, mm -hmm. of the support is mm -hmm. those people that are, are not wanting to come over here in, into this camp with regulated, they, they just don't want to do it or they can't do it for whatever reason. They want to continue doing what they're doing, but how can we help them to do what they're doing better stronger how can we help them to raise their bar so that they differentiate themselves from what they class as poor training that that's I think a, the question i think how do we do I think, that? I think a lot of that's bearing in mind that a lot of these people have had no resources to to know these things yeah. if you've gone through that route nobody's done anything wrong i'm just in the middle of doing a presentation actually about this and and it's nobody's fault. If you've no, gone down that road, no. there is no regulatory body, no regulating body to tell you these things. No. So if you don't have the information available, there's nothing to say people have got to be on the right forums, have got to be signing up to the to the right newsletters or anything else. So I think it's recognizing that nobody's done any, not everybody's done something wrong. And then just filtering the information out there, getting the right information, and also finding um, routes that people can go down the um, awarding bodies and not just accreditation and making that available and trying to get everybody down that kind of channel if they can but yeah respecting people that have come I mean that's the key true. is respect um, and, is and that's that. what is, is disappearing from our industry greatly mm -hmm. I mean Danielle has said you know you need to ensure that you've got the underpinning knowledge and you've got the knowledge this comes back to you know should we have a benchmark that says you need to have X number of, of years in the industry before, you know, uh, we had it. When Habia first was set up with it, which was 2002, and it was actually called the Beauty Industry Authority, um, they put in place in their assessment strategy that um, assessors had to have been qualified for two years before they could train to be an assessor. And that to be an IQA, an internal verifier, you had to have been an assessor for, I think it was a year before you could even train. And they had to remove that because it was deemed to go against age discrimination because it was more about, can you do the job, not um, how long you had been doing it for. And that I think opened the gateway for a whole issue of de, I say deregulate is the wrong word, um, damming down of, of standards and and criteria it was the same with the beauty side of things as well. I remember I, when I applied to be going to my teacher training I had to prove that I'd been in the industry for at least four years before I was allowed on the course mm -hmm. um, so is that that was all around that same time I was part of the camp as well with the assessors and the verifiers I had to wait strategically at those points as well and that's why um, when you look at the criteria from the awarding organization or the um, uh, uh, accrediting organization some of them will actually ask for specific um, uh, criteria they will say you've got to have been teaching for x number you've got to hold an assessor's award and some won't so it's about educating uh, the people that are thinking about going into education and training and the people that are in education and training who do they want to put their money with you know whose badge of honor do they want to to have and how can that awarding organization help build up their skills or is it just a money-making thing or is it just an insurance but then that's another big question because actually even though you are you've had your your course accredited does not mean to say that you are actually insured mm. but that's for another time <laughs> there are a couple of comments um in the chat as well um, while you're doing that though, if you're hmm. to say that I, I, I totally agree that with Louise and, you know, and, and Donna, that there are places where, you know, you just need a CPD. And an example of that for me is, um, I'm not particularly into lashes and things like that. So I just did a CPD in that because I wasn't wanting to be, you know, focused specifically on that, but I wanted to have the knowledge to do it and, you know, uh, and, and so that for me was more than enough to do. So, you know, and I, I work with awarding bodies and whatever, but I wouldn't have gone down the road to do that. So that where it points out again is what 
is the student's need. And I think that points it out very clearly. But Kim, I would argue that that wasn't CPD. It was short course provision. You did a short yeah, course yeah, yeah. You didn't do but a qualification. Well. You can't yeah. do CPD in something you're not already qualified in. So but this whole did. word CPD so. has just is just crazy, and people don't understand the point of CPD is to continue, is to develop, yeah, not yeah, to learn yeah, a new skill. Yeah. It doesn't help with a couple of accrediting companies using CPD in their title. I think that actually confuses the matter a little bit for everybody. Yeah, some rewarding bodies will accept that as a CPD. I think that's what I mean to clarify. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yes, but that's a different. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Okay, so. Sarah, um, Sarah just popped a, a little comment in there as well, um, saying, Louise, we offer MVQs to adult learners, um, but they must be assessed in the commercial setting. Um, oh, hang on, it's moving. So in a role where they are working on fee paying customers, they are not all family and friends. And I think that's like just as a distinguishing kind of point between the MVQ and the VRQ and MVQ must be assessed on a paying customer, whereas a VRQ gave you that small flexibility um, to be assessed on family, friends and colleagues. However, I don't know anybody in my little world that teaches to that. It's always on paying clients anyway, or clients. So and I run my business in exactly the same way. Um, as well but that that was the, 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 the uh, excuse me put my right teeth in as well and um, distinguishing between the two as well like those two particular things um, there is also another little comment a little bit further up as well because Kate I haven't forgotten about you I was keeping an eye on it but there were things coming <laughs> up at the same time so I'm like trying to watch the chat to make sure no one gets missed um, so Kate um, you said about if you offered both um, how would you differentiate price um, considering the different assessment processes so for example I'm assuming you're meaning like someone like myself where I offer my VRQs and then I offer my accredited stuff Actually, it's a small add-on for me. My pricing is very much based on the outcome. So it's based on what they will be able to do at the end. I don't just pluck a number out of the air or pick, you know, a little 50 quid under Sally down the road or something like that when I do mine. Um, so I base it, my pricing on the outcome anyway. And then there is additional time that I book out for um, the assessment side of things, so like the formative assessment and the summative assessment. Um, so I guess for one of a better word, if you don't know the difference between those two, it's like, like case studies and the official exam. Um, I book out the additional time for that and that's where the additional fees come from, plus obviously paying for the certificate from the awarding body. So the input for me, again, the delivery is the same, the price for the delivery is the same, but mm. going that extra step and having that assessment process I'm charging for my time and that's the way I, I work out my kind of finances for things like that and that works quite well for me um, as a centre. Mm. I don't know about anybody else. <laughs> I'd just also say if a question that they want to ask but they actually don't want to be seen to be asking the question then please um, direct message either myself or Donna um, and we won't mention your name because <laughs> I know sometimes there's things like you kind of think I really want to ask that but I don't want anybody to know that I don't know that <laughs> so yeah. please you know do, do do feel free to do that because the whole point of this is to to try and help um, help you you know developed yeah okay um Rebecca do you do individual oh, oh no it moves it jumps through and yeah. comes up <laughs> do you do individual units from VRQ alongside um the short courses yes that's the reason why I've picked sitting guilds <laughs> <laughs> um, um over v over VTCT because some of those don't scale down enough for me I've had um I cropped up with a few issues with um with my VTCT stuff um where I had students that wanted just to go down the facial electrotherapy um, and to offer that as a certificate I either had to have the microbiology unit which I don't have access to a lab so I wasn't doing that one um, and at the time I looked it might have changed now but at the time I looked um, or they had to do the certificate in level three which meant they had to do body massage and I had people that absolutely categorically did not want to do body massage they wanted to be Specialists, um, and so that's when I slowly started plotting my way out of VTCT, and then going down the application route for City and Gills as a satellite centre. Um, so that's the kind of the reason why. So yeah, VRQs you can get as singular units, but it depends on the awarding organisation about how they've organised those. Because again, same standards, but they get organised in their own little special way with their own little pretty rubber stamps on it and mm. paperwork and stuff. But the content is always the same. Mm. I think there's also there is the provision for you to um, 
to put together a package. So I'm working on something at the moment. I've got somebody who is brand new, uh, hasn't done anything before, but uh, is not new to business and wants to create a skincare business. So her end goal is the level four stuff. And we're sort of trying to plot and put together um, a pathway for her, which will start with the level two skincare obviously um and but it's where do we go from there how can we get support from um the underwriters and the insurance to ensure that she has got the necessary pathway and experience so my my role is to is to carve that out and it won't all be with what i can offer her i will be liaising with other training providers to to pick off some of the units which they offer that maybe we don't or we don't have the expertise um, and it's trying to create a package for that person um, and then going on from uh, something that samantha said yeah, I'd, um, how do we help them? I don't think we can. Um, I think, uh, so her question was, how do we help those people that are determined to do terrible things? And I think the answer is we can't. Um, we can only champion what we do. So when, when a learner contacts us or uh, somebody else contacts us and says, um, I'd like to do dermaplaning, I've never done facials before, can I do it online? You say, well, yes, you can do it online. However, <laughs> I would never recommend that route because X, Y, and Z. These are my reasons as an employer. This is my reason as a professional in the industry. I don't believe that you will actually be good at what you do and will not be putting yourself in, um, in a situation where you could be sued. <laughs> so I need to become the norm. And I think that's the only thing that we can do is champion what we think is right, not criticise what is wrong, because that then just leads to this whole, you know, it's almost like, um, you know, children, if you tell children they've got to clear up their bedroom, they won't. But if you tell them that actually it's a great thing to do because they'll find a chocolate underneath their toys, they might go looking and tidy them up. So it's, it's that kind of cajoling and trying to get everybody to kind of, this is how we want to work. We, we need to become the norm as well. We need to become the majority. So I think what's happened over the last couple of years is people have, have accepted that there is terrible teachers, terrible people doing treatments and become overwhelmed by it. Mm. And what we need to be doing is we need to become the norm. We need to now be the larger category and not trying to stop that, but trying to make it more attractive to become the better, that makes sense. <laughs> Definitely, and I think we need to, the main thing I think as well is like teaching people to buy better, educating them how to buy better, what to question, what they can't question. And I think it comes back to um, that whole kind of thing um, about seeing that accreditation sometimes is that big rubber stamp thing as well, but actually then not just taking everything at face value and actually, unfortunately, because it falls on your head as the person delivering the treatment, you have to do your own due diligence and you have to check and ask. Um, and if someone isn't prepared to give you the answers, then that should raise up like a red flag as well. So it's really about kind of giving them like a checklist almost, like this is how you buy. Buy. Um, it's going to be one of my things for next week, actually. But yeah, this is how you kind of buy things. This is a little bit of a checklist. These are things that your educator should happily. I mean, I would happily show someone my certificates. <laughs> it wouldn't bother me in the slightest. Yeah. I'm an open yeah. book. Um, you shouldn't obviously have to because you should have the information available and things as well. But equally, you know, if you want to check someone, I mean, I get people asking me all the time about the AET stuff and things like that, and I'm constantly checking that. Um, and if someone says they're accredited, um, like, you know, going through, um, say, VTCT as an off-call register, I will go onto VTCT's website and check they fall under that list <laughs> just to make sure, you know, you can do these checks. If someone's saying they're off-call registered by VTCT, you can go on their website and check that. Um, and it's about making sure just because they say they are or say they're doing something because they picked up on a buzzword. So I've noticed a few now using the, the off-call buzzword when they're not actually off-call. Um, again, it's just double checking. Don't just take everything face value do some good digging find people that have had it done before ask some more questions about what's involved particularly the assessment method how will it be delivered and how will it be assessed and how will they know um, you're competent and how will you show them you're competent mm. um, again it's all coming back to like how do you buy courses mm. better and you mm. know watching a youtube link online probably isn't going to be any communication at all that's going to demonstrate your competence mm. yeah um, Rebecca's asked a question about delivering online um, and um, I think the answer to that Rebecca is it depends on what 
Um, so one of the, I think, really good things is that the, the use of Zoom now can, can do amazing things. There are things that you can do. And certainly we have, um, as, an, as a training organization, have actually used Zoom as part of our processes. So we, we do deliver some online. Um, so just to give you a, an example, we, we specialize in complementary therapy. So it's a little bit different from putting a scalpel on somebody's face, I know. Um, but we had just started two groups of reflexologists literally the week before <laughs> lockdown in, back in March. And we were like, oh my God, how are we gonna do this? Um, but because there is so much around the subject, you don't have to just have your hands on feet. You can talk about case studies. You can talk about obviously all the anatomy and physiology we've got. And I had, um, I, I was so happy that we did this. The previous year, we had actually looked at all of our courses and I had actually developed a whole online training program for anatomy and physiology, but also um, uh, principles and practices, health and safety, all of those sorts of things, reflective practice that we put into our reflexology. So there's an awful lot that you can do. There's a lot of discussion that you can do um, and you can signpost people to sort of doing their own. I actually sent a pair of latex um, feet. I don't know whether anybody knows uh, Lorraine Morris, but she has a, a company that um, it's called TLT and she's got latex heads, latex feet, latex arms, latex legs. She doesn't have a latex body, unfortunately, um, but these are training aids that um, are, are used Used for all sorts of things they've got plastic masks that go over that you can do makeup over um, you can actually do uh, massage over the face decollete um, uh, you can do electrolysis piercing with them so you can do probing techniques into them hands and arms you can do massage over them and, and nails and all sorts of things so I actually sent some um, uh, feet to one of my students who actually didn't even live with anybody so she had these feet that she was able to to work the reflex points and learn routines so it wasn't a case of she was um, uh, actually being assessed online um, but um, you you can embed it in your training so it becomes more of a blended way um, so it can be done it depends on what it is that you're doing and so you can think about how you can maybe preempt some of the work that you do keep your learners in discussion and when we came back in whenever it was July I think I was absolutely blown away by my reflexology students who were reflexologists in their heart they knew what they were talking about and it was it was just phenomenal absolutely phenomenal so i know it can work but it does very much depend on on what you're doing um, I think online's a, sorry i was saying i think online is quite a broad term isn't it because actually there's a lot of things that kind of come off of that isn't it and i think the thing that obviously you're saying about is that interaction i think if it's going to be online and you're teaching you just need that interaction and if you're watching a youtube clip that is an interaction and that's okay. not obviously definitely not be appropriate for everything but you know i've got rubber feet with students at the minute yeah <laughs> But it's also, it's about a, a, a stepping stone towards, it's one of your dev developmental processes. You still need to actually get hands on in the classroom, being seen, being felt, you know, pressure is really important as well. And knowing, you know, that interaction with clients, that's the bit that you can't see. So to actually watch the learner do that whole process. And I know Kim, you're doing international examinations at the moment, which is like, whoa, and watching them all on Zoom. We've actually just done our first remote written exam um, online um, and that was that was phenomenal the way we did it but I had to have a process I I had to um, put all the, the the paperwork in an envelope I put labels over it I signed over it we sent it recorded delivery they all opened it together online and they took out their paper then they had to put a label on it to go back sign it show that they'd actually done it and then it was received back a couple of days by recorded post so there are things that we can do and this is all awarding bodies have what they call mitigation at the moment which is how how on earth can we adapt to try and keep some kind of quality? And that's been really useful because what it does do is it allows you to think, actually, I could use that bit in a way in which I deliver and make my, my training much more um, specific and personable to that person to remove, remove barriers. And that's really what we want to be doing is removing barriers, but keeping quality, I think. Well, that's something I've, I've um, wanted to do some level, particular level four courses. And I've been doing all the theory online and the research and everything. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, that I've, I've got time to really get that knowledge in there and completely understand it. And then when we open back, you mm -hmm. know, yes, I've shown things, but then when we open back, 
I'm out there and I'm doing all the practical. So yeah, you're absolutely right in doing the different, yeah. you know, utilizing the Zoom and everything yeah. to, to help with the, the training. But I think that's yeah, it so I think the other way where it comes in as well is that not some people, particularly if you're an adult learner um, and you haven't been in education maybe at all or for a long time, um, that actually just even just initially a few steps over something like a Zoom call and they're, they're in their own home, they're in a safe environment and they haven't had to step into that classroom. Like we've all had that fear when we've had to walk into a classroom on our own because you didn't go on your training course with your mates. Um, and, you know, even I get that now, like even now, um, you know, and I'll chat to anybody, me, but it takes me a few minutes just to kind of gauge everybody and stuff and what I can, what kind of crazy really that I can let out and what I can't let out is usually the case for me. But I think for some people as well, some of that initial online steps actually for some really basic things um, can just really help really and just get them comfortable and confident with that learning again teaching them how to learn um, and getting them back into that environment again before maybe you kind of you know walk into a classroom as well so it does have some really good benefits yeah, um, yeah. yeah. and then there's some things obviously yeah clearly I mean I'm, I sit part of the camp of I wouldn't even do a, a demo plane over zoom because I'm all about the angles and stuff like that and you got a scalpel um and that's fine for people to disagree with if that's the case as well but you know there are some things i think it's appropriate for and then there are some things i don't think it's appropriate and, and for, it's but absolutely it's finding not that balance. appropriate to only do online i think that's the that's the concern that danielle's got is that there are plenty of places that are only doing online and absolutely that's not that's not acceptable linda yeah, I was, um, I was just reading a magazine that came through this morning. It was, it's a beauty magazine. I haven't had a look through all of it, but um, one of the articles was saying that um, really positive feedback from this face-to-face -face online teaching over Zoom and how the students are feeling really comfortable. So they're actually cause they're only in their own surroundings. Yes. And I, I found that myself as well. I've, I've found that that because they're just focused on you. There's no... Um, there's nothing going on around them they're actually able to achieve much more mm. um so I, I, I found it really positive and i think as you said before louise i think that blended learning i think this is going to be something that is going to be for the future mm. and i saw that a few people had mentioned on the chat there that they were it's not for them they're really uncomfortable with it but it is out of everyone's comfort zone i know it's not something that we've had to do before but literally after you've done a couple of times um you do become really comfortable with it and even now i can see that a lot of people haven't got the cameras on but even just something like this really appreciate this you doing this louise just even being able to just put your camera on now mm -hmm. and just see everybody that's going to give you a confidence boost to be able to go on and take that next step and do that because at first i was like oh no i don't like seeing myself on camera but literally for you doing this for us louise is, is really a, i really appreciate this and uh -huh. it gives me confidence as well when i'm speaking with everyone here mm -hmm. and um just you know if, if you could just bring yourselves to put your cameras on um it is an encouragement um for everybody and it I, I think that it definitely will help you to move on with this for the future because i think this is going to be the way that we are going to use our blended learning Thank you, Linda. I think that's really valuable comments, actually. And that's the teacher in you, isn't it? Is stretching and developing your uh, <laughs> your comfort zone. So thank you. I think definitely with something like that, you could practice. You could get a couple of friends um, and maybe just practice the setup and things like that. So it's not the first time you're going to do it mm. on your own with your students. Maybe just grab a couple of, you know, people in the house or a couple of friends or something like that just practice the first 10 minutes of your lesson and the setup you know is the camera angles right all that kind of stuff so you don't have to go in kind of cold turkey straight in there it's just you know you can practice in a nice little safe environment first um, and then kind of step up a little bit too and I, I think I think anybody in this this group, if, if you reached out and said, you know, I'm I would love to do it, but I really don't know how to do it or what to do it or, you know, I want one of those snazzy backgrounds that uh, um, that you've got. Uh, in fact, I'll put mine on as well, uh, Donna. <laughs> You know, I, I want a different background because my, you know, my my house is is looking, you know, terrible. Um, then you know, we'll, we'll help you and we'll show you how you can actually put, you know, a virtual background on so that actually you are, you know, being seen in a different way. So there we are, I've just put my virtual background on because I forgot to put it on earlier. I need to do one like that. Yeah, <laughs> so you can actually see <laughs> the legs in the way. 
you know, so, so I think that my message here and, and what um, uh, the industry support network is really about is, is about championing the people that want to be championed, championed, um, bringing collaborative working together, raising the standards, raising the benchmark. There are so many little pockets of people wanting to do the same thing and we need to kind of join the dots i mean helen's doing a phenomenal work with um, beauty united and and really trying to to uh, raise the engagement of issues that are in the industry um and i'm sure that there are lots and lots of different pockets as well and 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 i just want to say you know let let's let's do this together let let's all kind of join the dots so my strap line for industry support network is is help me help you help others and let's just go around in that circle and just keep keep that wheel of of progression going that that's that's my aim really louise thank you very much because it's it is amazing this and what i love about this is i can get to talk to all my colleagues <laughs> and just back to talk about our industry with people that you know are in it and working and everything it's just fun you're yeah. doing my talk to this morning brilliant no, I'm sleeping on a Saturday night, I'm out of bed going, oh yeah, I'm getting to see everybody and have a speak about our industry. So brilliant. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Oh, thank you everybody for joining me this morning. Um, just lastly, I just wanted to say if there's any other questions that you've got that you didn't want to post, please do find either Donna or myself or Kim. We'd be more than happy, or, or Helen or anybody. We're, um, I think that you're here because you want to help and you want to make things better. So please do reach out. Um, yes, I did set up the, the, the database. Um, it is in the uh, hair and beauty educator verifier and it's got a very long name um, but find me and I'll <laughs> I'll put you in the right direction um, it is there so you can download it um, I um, need to do an update I said I'd do an update every month so I have got about 20 people that I need to put on there so if you're not on there at the moment you probably will be on next time round um, so I just wanted to run down the um, the other titles that I've got and if there's anything else that you want to add to this we can keep going because I think lockdown's going for a little bit longer isn't it so next week we're looking at funding and finance. <laughs> um, then we're looking at types of qualifications. So who are they appropriate for? Then we've got um, apprenticeships and EPAs and how you as an industry professional can actually put your money where your mouth is and stop criticizing training and get involved. Um, and then we've got assessment and IQA, the structure and process and how you can put that into your short course, regardless of um, you know what what you're doing you can still have assessment and uh, quality assurance then i wanted to have um a sort of a session on knowledge skills and behaviors because that's a bit of a buzzword for the new t-level uh qualifications everything is around behaviors and i think that's one of the things the, the sand that's disappeared around our stones is all about the values and behaviors so we want to look at that also insurance you know are you actually insured <laughs> is a very very big question um, and then lastly a sort of a, what you need to do to how you can invest in your training business and how you can make your business a better business um, and looking at that sort of from the, the wider picture what do we need to do to grow um, and have more learners better learners um, yeah so if anybody's got anything else that they'd like to bring to the table to discuss um, happy to co-host with anybody that would like to be don't have to have me nattering on to you um, all the time. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh.